um, I'll do a quick intro here, you guys. I just want a lot of you guys that are on uh, know Rick. For those of you that don't know Rick, Rick Malero, his capital. Um, I'll let you talk about that for a second, but I just want to do a, a intro to the people that don't uh, know Rick, haven't uh, met Rick before, seen him at one of the events. He's a strategic partner of ours at um, Riki. So he's a real estate investor, but also lender. And obviously he's one of the few lenders that you're still out there lending today, right? Yeah, we are. Yeah, so navigating through this, and it's not because of ignorance and just saying, screw it, like let's just go out and keep lending. You actually have more data than any other lender that I've talked to or met. So I like that, you know, you're going through it. Uh, diligently um, going through st uh, statistics and trends of what's happened before in similar situations in the past. So, and how to navigate through this and what you guys see uh, versus, you know, other people. And I'm sure there's some similarities, but for the people here at Reiki, uh, I imagine everybody here on today's call is uh, part of the Reiki team. So, I appreciate again uh, that you're taking time. It is later for, again, you're out of Florida, so uh, it's getting late. So I do appreciate your time and spending it with us and, and educating us on what you guys see and projections and what, uh, what's to come. So you guys, uh, if you guys could give it up to, to Rick for-, for Virtual high fives. Yeah, virtual <laughs> high fives uh, for taking the time because this is, there's a Thank lot you. of data. So please, you guys, just if there's questions, I'm going to be asking some questions for you guys too as they come through. Um, but uh, yeah, Rick, please, if you could touch on his capital, just brief, briefly, if you could, and then kind of yeah. we could dive in. Yeah, so, we'll dive into the questions. Absolutely, guys. Well, first of all, I'm honored to be here. I'm actually excited that I got to sneak to the office today just to take a break from, <laughs> from the house. <laughs> Um, but um, anyway, so yeah, so my name is Rick. I'm a real estate investor. I've been doing this now for almost 16 years and um, started as a wholesaler, kind of evolved into owning my own real estate. And thank God that in 2006, almost 2007, I encountered a gentleman at one of the seminars that I was speaking at who basically called me out. He said I was working for tips. And uh, long story short, it was very humbling, but it really challenged me to pivot. So I got in commercial and sure enough, 2008, 2009 happened. And the only thing that kept me afloat was my commercial investments. And so I'm a huge believer in cash flow and diversification. So once we got the business restructured and we started doing business again, we started diversifying even more. We became a private lender. We love that business a lot. It's kind of the spear to all the other strategies. And it gives us a great opportunity to get intel on everything that's going on, to find out who the real players are. And so it's been an awesome journey. So we're in the process now of launching our third fund. We're going to raise about $50 million. It's a class A offering. So we'll have a chance to deal with investors that are not accredited and accredited investors. So we're pretty excited. And um, now the goal is again to learn from this and use this as an opportunity to actually catapult to the next level. And that's what I'm hoping today is. It's, it's not, I want to scare people. I want to inform people and empower them to really go to the next level. Yeah, perfect. I think it's good to have that information so people understand you know, what it is that we're getting into and more importantly, how to navigate through it. So absolutely. Yes, so if you want, that's queued up for you there. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. So our questions, is there any historical data from past pa pandemics that we could learn from to navigate during these uncertain times? Yeah. So that's a, that's been a really very popular question. A lot of people want to know, do you have any data? And so to be honest with you, the moment we started finding out that this whole COVID-19 thing was going to be a, a big deal, uh, we went back with our economists that we have on staff and just started digging into the data. So what I want to show you, I think this is a really big thing for us to gain perspective. What I want to give you is a visual real quick. And what you're looking at on the screen is literally a visual chart of moments in time where our country uh, has had different economic corrections. And we're going all the way to the 1797 here. Now, we don't have time today. I don't want to give you this boring, long story about each and every correction, what happened. But what I want you to see is that first and foremost, this is not the first correction by far. And 2008 was not the first correction. So what I want you to do is look at this screen and you'll see in, in 1797, there was a market correction. 1857 was a major correction. 1873, 1893, I think you're getting a trend. This is cyclical because of some things that I'll talk about later. 
1907 obviously was another correction, but then we had a major correction which took place in 1918. I highlighted this in red because this was the first economic correction. It was right, past, or right after the World War I. So we had a country that was literally coming back, many soldiers that were coming back unemployed. There was no job for them. And of course, some of those soldiers brought with them uh, the influenza virus. That pandemic, well, I'll, I'll chime into on that a little bit later to give you some history on that. That was a major catastrophic uh, situation. And so just imagine an economic correction with a pandemic that was worse than what you're looking at today. So I'll just leave it at that and I'll talk about it. But even that too passed. Then we have 1929 was the, the Great Recession, 1945. And I can go on and go on. You can see the trends here, but I want to fast forward real quick to 2001. In 2001, we had a tech bubble, which is where you started seeing all these dot-com websites and all these speculative investments really started exploding to make, you know, to add insult to injury. We had a 9-11 happen to us, which also had a major impact in our economy. And then to, to make that just a little triple whammy, we had a SARS pandemic begin to take place. Now, the reason why most of us probably don't remember is because in that particular pandemic, there were less than 10,000 people infected in our government and the, the global leaders actually were able to nip it in the butt and stop it from really expanding the way that the coronavirus has. So I wanted you to see that, again, we've had cycle after cycle. And while it is important to understand that these were all these bad times, this too will pass. And that's the most important to realize is you might be in this moment now and you're concerned, you're scared, but this too will pass. If you were in the correction of 2008, you know that it was terrible. People were depressed, but here we are, 2020, right? And so again, just know that even though we can learn from these economic corrections, at the end of the day, this corona situation too will pass. Uh, now, if I can, I just wanna show you a couple of visuals. So with SARS, I want you to gain a little perspective. The reason why I'm sharing this information with you is because um, this COVID-19 situation is literally our first historical economic uh, recession that we're in due to not any other factors other than the fact that we are self-inflicting wounds. Just to be preventative, we stopped doing business, which caused our market to go down. Uh, again, we talked about how SARS had other pre predetermined issues. You already had the tech bubble, you had 9-11, and then you get SARS. So you can see here that there was a loss of about 1.75% of the GDP. We can talk more about that later, but look at the real estate stats. What you'll see is the stats literally only dropped by only 1.9%. What, what people really saw during the SARS uh, pandemic was that about 33% of the inventory froze from going on the market and didn't sell for the period of the pandemic. And shortly after that, it grew. So for example, look at the S&P 500. Yes, it dropped. It dropped during that time. But what happened shortly after is once it was under control, we had an increase in a growth stage that was pretty substantial. This right here, of course, was the correction of 2008. Uh, now let's take a look at the housing starts. So yes, housing starts fell during the pandemic. But guess what? It started to rise again afterwards when it was under control. And the point I'm trying to make here, guys, is this too will pass. There is going to come, once we have this under control, our market isn't just going to stay depressed. We're not going to stay at home forever, guys, thank God. Um, and so again, look at the actual housing sales prices. Yes, they dip slightly, but they pick back up in a roaring fashion which is what ultimately was a part of the correction uh, that we dealt with. So again, I think this is a critical piece for everybody to understand is that we're in a pandemic. This is the first recession we've ever been in that actually was caused by ourselves. So I don't know if you want to chime in on that, John, or not. But. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a new historical uh, fact that, you know, obviously we'll see, we'll see how to, this all plays out, but um, unlike the last time in 2008, where it was more like a deck of cards, our economy was strong. There was no indicators. Uh, and I would touch base uh, periodically with people, you know, on Wall Street and things like that and secondary market just to see, you know, hey, what are you guys seeing? And everybody was very optimistic. There was nothing out there that was uh, going to or, you know, there was there was nothing out there problematic that would cause a big correction. Well, no one really saw this coming, like not like it, it not like it all unfolded, but yeah, it's, uh, it's different. So as soon as we could get this behind us, I think uh, we could kind of get things back on track, but uh, yeah. yeah. And we'll share some more data on that too. I really think, cause it's key for us to understand what we could expect so that we can prepare now for it, but absolutely. Ready right. for the next one? Ready. 
Yeah, so this is a big one. We've heard of the unemployment uh, filings reaching over 16 plus million people. Uh, what do we make of this information um, and how do we adapt to the new normal? And this, this number could be growing or is growing, right? Absolutely. So, yeah, and until yeah. we get back to work, it will continue to. So yeah. uh, could you touch on this? Absolutely. You know, what's interesting is you, we talked about this, like it's changing like the stock market. So we almost have to have a live PowerPoint to change numbers. Uh, we're probably closer to 25 to 30 million right now. So it's right. more than double since we were talking about these Q&As. Uh, so to give you perspective, I want to give you a picture. I was talking to my economist on this and he talked about this is one of the key indicators he always looks at for any market recession period. So across the board. So what you're looking at here is from the 1970, well, 67, these are the unemployment claims that you see, uh, even up, literally looking here, look at this, 2008, I mean, it looks like a dot compared to what we're looking at here. What you see as the red line here is what he calls the equilibrium. And in essence, what he's saying is, we will be in a higher indicator. You can see the points here throughout the different portions of when there were market corrections, uh, including this one. He's like, anytime you have unemployment filings drop through this threshold, there's already a sign that there's gonna be a market correction. Well, not too long ago, this is the number we reached. So not only did we cross the line, we freaking blew it out of the water. Now, it sounds scary, people are scared out of their minds, but I wanna give you a little perspective. It's alarming, but this is very convoluted. Now, what do I mean by it being convoluted? Uh, when you really take a look at these numbers, this is the first time in history that we have a president with enough guts, we'll leave it that way, to actually take massive action and try to find ways to create subsidies to help individuals, uh, 1099 employees or slash small entrepreneurs and uh, businesses. And so he's thrown a lot of money and a lot of incentives, which has created an opportunity for people that are 1099 working as contractors for businesses to apply for unemployment. You have real estate agents across the nation who are applying for unemployment, even though they still are licensed agents, they're still transacting, but they're commissioned only, so they've been impacted financially. And so what the, governor, what the government did is said, hey, look, just go through our unemployment process. That's where you get approved. In a minute, I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, but again, so there's a lot of people that still have jobs that are technically unemployed in these filings. Now, to give you perspective of how the numbers have changed, I mean, this is incredible how many people. So we're already, this was just this past week. I mean, we're at 25 million. Uh, uh, un, you know, unemployment filings. And so that is going to clog the pipeline. People that are actually needing the money are going to have to be patient on some of these. But the point I want to make here, guys, is that it is convoluted, but there's even opportunity in this mess uh, as well. Um, another piece I want to look at, and this I think is important for everyone. This is something my economist was saying a lot. Uh, also, the other second big key indicator he looks at is basically month over month employment growth in job opportunities. Uh, by the way, if you want to look this up, you can even Google it and look it up online. They publish this data on the very first Friday of every month. And so again, what you see in this, in this red line is kind of an equilibrium. So what he's basically telling us is that we need to be looking at at least 200,000 new jobs coming into the marketplace. And I do believe with the payment protection program and a variety of different stimulus packages, we will start seeing more of these opportunities. Now, um, so if you're looking for a job, if you got fired and you're kind of doing real estate on the side and this is kind of an opportunity, I will be honest, I'd be looking at this extremely aggressively because I'll give you a perfect example. Companies like myself and John, I know you just, just got approved. We're working together hand in hand to, to get a part of this uh, payment protection program to protect our employees, right? And so, but this, this situation has really put a lot of perspective, at least for me and my business. And I'm sure, John, you're doing the same thing because we've, we've been dialoguing about this. But you know, when something like this happens and you have a restart, an opportunity for the next 60 days to figure out who you're going to keep, who you're going to employ, you really start asking yourself, who's an asset in my company and who's a liability? Who's somebody that's just coming here and at 4.55 p.m., you hear the keys, you know, jingling and they're just ready to go. They're here for the paycheck, right? So what's happening right now is you have, you have all these unemployment people, you know, filings taking place and people looking for opportunities and you have businesses like ours that are going, hey, wait a minute. If we got another 90, 60, 90 days to grow this, uh, why don't I just get rid of my liabilities and bring in some assets and start headhunting? So we're literally recruiting right now top talent to come in for some of the positions. And the people that aren't performing in our office, we've already been writing them up and telling them, hey, if you don't go up to this next level, we're going to switch. So I really believe there's a lot of businesses doing the same thing 
that are going to be creating great opportunities and great income opportunities, but what they want is better talent than the committed people or the lack of commitment that they have currently. So I don't know about you, John, you want to chime in on that? Cause yeah, absolutely. We're doing the same thing. Uh, we're more of looking at it as an opportunity to pivot into the, some of the other things that we wanted to do. Uh, we wanted to change up our model slightly. We've done that. We're doing that. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe doing stuff more on a local level as, as well in each city instead of um, deploying out and doing like a seminar type thing. We'll actually have shop set up in those in some specific uh, cities or states and then we'll slowly grow that so that was our model that we started working on last year but haven't been able to necessarily deploy it where now we can so we're we are doing that that's awesome yeah it's good stuff yeah so so there's definitely opportunity guys and so that i'd be looking for that as well if, especially if you don't have a a solid job or you've been choir load or you know whatever it is that's, that's gone on just be looking for those opportunities um I guess we have the next question here, <clears throat> which kind of leads to what we were talking about earlier. Yeah, so how solid uh, was our economy before the pandemic? You know, and you kind of alluded to this too, John, earlier. Um, what people don't realize in the last correction, and, and I want you to kind of get a picture for this, which is kind of crazy actually. Um, what you're looking at on the screen right now is uh, kind of a pre-pandemic fundamentals that were there. So this really proves that this is a self-inflicted wound. In 2007, so right before that crash that everybody remembers still, the banks only had $44 billion combined in reserves. That is nothing for banks, by the way, guys. I mean, these guys are doing billions and billions of dollars uh, versus as of February, right before the pandemic really went haywire, uh, there was over $1.7 trillion with a T that these banks had in reserves. So the fundamentals for the banks alone to be able to continue to do business and serve their clients was exponentially higher than anything we've seen historically. So that's a really good sign that we were in a growth stage. If you, um, sorry. No, go ahead. If you could go back a few slides to the unemployment, I think we could probably look at uh, how that was even trending down. I don't know if, uh, if you're controlling this or someone else or is Brandon. Oh, wait, okay, so right here, I mean, right before it shoots up, I mean, it's at a historical low, right? I Literally. Mean, um, I mean, that thing's continuing to dip if you look at that before it shoots yeah. up. But if you're saying that baseline right there is, is the red, and that's the indicator that we have an issue on the horizon, well, we were trending the exact opposite way. It was 100%. I agree 100%. It, it was a massive difference uh, for sure. And, and now, if it was just the banks, I'd say, okay, well, they're playing Monopoly. But look at corporate filings for, as far as their profits. Right. You can see here in 2007 and 8, this is where they were. This is what they were claiming as of December uh, of 2019. So they were more profitable than ever. The banks had more reserves. And then when you talk about corporate cash on hand, these are what they were claiming to have as far as liquidity, as far as the companies. Look at 2007 and look at where we were. I mean, it's yeah. a pretty substantial difference. This is across the board. I mean, it shows the health of yes corporate america so yeah. exactly so that's a good thing and that's the thing i want to tell people we can all get scared we can all be panicked and say oh my gosh we're having this recession which is true it's kind of scary but when you really look back and look at the core fundamentals we're only in this position because it's a self-inflicted choice that we've made and so we just have to trust that you know this social distancing really will work and we'll talk more about that in a minute but i just thought this would be a good picture to realize that our economy was roaring it was doing really well and, um, and I'm, I'm very confident that it will roar back in the near future. Yeah, thanks. That's a great visual. So yeah, let's, let's go through this. I mean, <laughs> I've, I've, I mean, I've been in lending for a while, but this was just about the fastest I've ever seen it go away. So let's talk about why did private lending dry up so quickly? What could we, uh, when could we expect that to come back? So, I mean, when it quickly, I mean, it was, instant one yes. one day it was excellent like on a monday it's one thing on a tuesday literally rates had jumped two and a half points um also ltvs got cut and a lot of people a lot of lenders that were um a lot of private lenders and lenders in general just sat said we're we're not funding we're going to sit on the sideline and even today you see 
people calling to verify job uh, employment uh, prior to funding, even though docs are signed, which is, you know, new, right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, anyways, yeah. But anyways, just touching on that, um, you want to talk about why it yeah. why it's dried up so I'll, fast? Uh, yeah, I'll do my best to elaborate. For those of you that are not in the banking industry, you know, I'll, 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 I'll try to make it as simple as I can because there's a lot of pieces behind this that people didn't realize. Now, to kind of give you perspective, and John, you know this because you've been doing this for a long time, you know, pre-2015, private money was really private money. <laughs> like you had to know somebody or if there was a private money lender, that guy raised the money, he was controlling the capital. There was no ties to Wall Street back then. This wasn't even a, a big market. Why? Because you're looking at maybe hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, nationwide of capital to deploy in these markets. So they were very, it was very small, it was a drop in the bucket. Now what started happening is of course, as the economy was slowly coming back, um, Wall Street is looking for other ways to find ways to securitize and get a good yield that's short term. And so then all of a sudden you start hearing, 2015 is when they started testing the waters. In 2017, you started seeing ads like this. Fix and flip mortgage bonds, Wall Street's new housing bet. Right? Yeah. And so all of a sudden these guys, you gotta remember we have hundreds of millions in our market and all of a sudden you get billions of dollars coming into the market. So right. how does Wall Street get into a market that's got hundreds of you know, millions of dollars and turn it into billions? Well, what they do is they look for the lenders that are already performing and they say, hey, I want to give you a line of credit or, hey, I want to buy your paper or, hey, I want to partner with you. And so before you know it, they're putting money with all these lenders. New lenders are coming from everywhere, but their exit strategy, meaning the mortgage that I fund that I sell off to the, to the institutions, those institutions are the same groups. And so before you know it, there's more competition. Access to capital is insanely available now. And why? Because... Wall Street has a chance to securitize this, sell this off, make a bunch of money. So before you know, we have from hundreds of millions to billions of dollars. Now, what, one thing I didn't know, John, this is actually really interesting, is most of the companies that realize it's all about a volume game, we wanna be the biggest lender in town. Some of these guys were originating $150 million in private money a month from private lenders. And what's interesting is, I kept wondering how much of this money did they really raise versus how much of this is in Wall Street? Right. We got to see this past month how much money is in Wall Street versus there. Because what happened is Wall Street created two different vehicles, which for those that don't know, uh, when you're doing this kind of volume, $150 million a month, you're not funding all those loans to hold them. In fact, you're funding to sell as quickly as you can. You're selling debt to these institutions. Right. And, but what happens is you get to a point where you don't have enough money to keep funding the volume. So these other institutions from Wall Street give you warehouse lines of credit. So a warehouse line of credit is supposed to be like almost like a hard money loan to fund the paper, sell it off, and you move on. So what ended up happening is in this, in this correction, you have these guys in midstream funding loans that they're going to sell off, and Wall Street pulls the plug from underneath. Yeah. So they say, crap, we got to stop funding because I can't have all these loans in my warehouse line because they're going to call them due. And sure enough, not even two weeks later, the actual warehouse line investors come in and say, I'm going after your portfolio if you don't pay me off. So some of those uh, uh, warehouse lines of credit are being called due right now. And guess what the security is? Their percentage and all the other loans they did. So these guys now are under fire trying to figure out how to get rid of those mortgages. Uh, I personally, because I do sell, but I never wanted to sell my soul to the devil. So what I did is I did join ventures with hedge funds that did, and I would fund our deals, and I would go ahead and sell a percentage of my portfolio to these guys that sold it to Wall Street. And I no joke, I probably had done about a million and a half that week in loans that was sold, they sent docs, signed them the whole nine to buy my mortgages. And they said, sorry, we can't buy them anymore. We're just gonna renege on our agreement. And so it was literally that instant because it realized, man, we can't keep this on a warehouse line. We're gonna go in default and be at risk. Wall Street pulled out. Now, why did Wall Street pull out? Yeah, why so yeah, let's talk about that. So the, the, the big piece here is there's a strategic play, right? So let's talk about the strategic play and what yeah. we going on there yes there's several layers some of which i'm sure it's beyond my over my head but the ones that, that we're talking about we see is you know that old rule still applies guys he who has the gold makes the rules and those guys have a lot of influence with our government and our country so what they did is they pulled out of many markets non-qualified mortgages disappeared overnight hard money lending basically disappeared overnight that's why most of those lenders went away and then they started putting pressure on the government 
So within a week, it didn't even take that long, within a week of them pulling out and the market just dropping, the government had to cut a deal. They said, here's what we'll do. We need you to keep lending. So at the very least in the retail lending space, we will guarantee to buy back your mortgages. So Wall Street is placing all their money and their safest bet right now is retail mortgages that are backed by the government. And so it's basically risk-free. Which, which uh, you don't really see uh, in the commercial space or haven't seen it in the commercial space, right? So yep. that's why like, there's so many uh, lenders that you need to go through and all of them may have different programs versus you know, when you get into the residential or even multifamily, they're mortgage-backed securities you know, backed mm -hmm. by the government, right? So there's incentives for that type of paper that they give. Uh, and you see more of a consistent underwriting guideline where when you get into, you know, other types of commercial real estate, it's, it's everybody, I don't want to say it's the wild, wild west, but everybody has their own underwriting criteria. So if they're able to drive this uh, ship to uh, the government, to Wall Street, essentially, and now we have, uh, you know, government, government backs mortgages for, um, people like myself doing, whether it's retail or medical or, you know, these strip malls, whatever it might be, that's a huge, uh, that, that would be huge for someone like myself. Oh, 100%. And what's cool is, I mean, you got to give it to them. So they move all their money now and they start pushing it towards retail, which is government backed. Then the government says, you can't just put all your money here. If we're buying this, you got to help us. And so they're using that as a tactic to negotiate with the government. So, well, if you were buying mortgages in commercial, I'd probably still be lending in commercial. And so it's, it's funny how they're using that to like pull, you know, uh, bend the arm of the government to say, fine, we'll, we'll subsidize that as well. So you're right. They just announced it. They're going to be buying some commercial paper. So this is good news for commercial lending. Cause that means that there's going to be some more transactions and maybe even more favorable terms uh, on the private hard money sector and residential. What I will say, and we'll talk more about that in a minute is that they are planning on coming back, but I've been in several conference calls with some of these hedge fund groups that are, they even have representatives from Wall Street talking about it. They see our space as a very distressed space. And the reason why they see that is because, again, that's their way to come back, right? So now they pulled out. They're going to come back. They're going to change their terms. The rates are going to go up, and all these other things are going to shift. So they'll come back soon. It's just the terms are going to be slightly different. So I just want you guys to be, to be aware of that transition as well. Okay. You guys, we'll get to your guys' questions too. I see that there's a few coming through. We'll go through that. That's them. awesome. Awesome. So you want to go to the next one real quick. So we'll transition that we have time. Okay. So you have helped many investors uh, get some government support to protect their businesses during these hard times. What are you, yeah, what are you doing? In fact, I should say you guys, uh, Rick help, helped us get our uh, PPP plan. If you guys don't know what that is, that's the payroll protection plan. Uh, taken care of. So again, I appreciate that. But yeah, could you touch on this as well? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and some of the seminars we've done, people say, what should I be doing? The first thing I tell people is put some oxygen in your lungs. Yeah. And part of that is, hey, you know, our president, I thank him for, the, for doing that. I mean, I necessarily like him as an individual. He's interesting. But um, let's just say he had the guts. He took some massive action that others would not have. And um, part of that was, again, creating some type of investment back into the company so that we can keep our employees hired. Um, one of the biggest bets that I'll say that really worked for us, a lot of people were going back to the big banks, Wells Fargo, you know, the big names that everybody knows, Chase and all those guys, they really, in my opinion, dropped the ball with this program substantially. But luckily for us, John, you know, our smaller bankers uh, were able to really roll up their sleeves, work on the weekends and get us approved in time. So let me kind of give you perspective. So the initial program was pretty substantial, 2.3 basically trillion dollars were going to be invested into our economy. This is just a quick visual of kind of where the money went. So the PPP program that John is talking about was basically meant to protect the employees. Is to say, look, listen, this is not your fault. This is not the employee's fault. Please don't fire them. We'll give you enough money for about two and a half months, basically, of whatever payroll is. And so you have to apply for support. This is tapped out. It's gone. Um, as far as the, there's all these other programs are gone. This is in route. So the 250 billion that's supposed to go to the individuals is still in route right now as we speak. Um, I would highly recommend if you want to get more information, we have some documents, you can just go to www.rickmalero.com forward slash forecast. 
and we give you a memo in the email automatically that will actually explain how you qualify for these programs. Now, even though this is out, if you, uh, if you own a business and you have employees and you still were not approved, you can email ppp at hiscapitalgroup.com. And just like we were working with John, we'll just connect you with our banker. Even though they're not taking immediate applications, if you have it and you haven't applied for it, I would highly encourage you to do that now. Be proactive because the money will go like this. Uh, I'll give you an example right now, just so you have a better picture. So in less than, I want to say in less than seven or eight days, they had allocated almost 100% of all the money for those $377 billion across the board to businesses. Of that, luckily, John, you and I are on this little <laughs> section sliver that basically says that we received our money, at least on most of the companies, and the other 74% is literally just sitting there waiting for the money to be deployed. Right. But because the money was allocated, is reserved for those people, but there's still literally thousands of other applications that haven't even made it to the threshold. So they need more money uh, is basically where we're at. There's other programs too. I'll explain these later. Uh, but in essence, what you can see is they haven't even deployed 1% of the 40% of the applications that are already in queue to get funded. So they're just running out of money so fast. And so if you waited too long, honestly, you really have to be proactive to do that. And we'll be happy to help you. Just email ppp at hiscapitalgroup.com and we'll just, it's all about introducing you to the right people. Uh, now, the next part, I call this round two of the stimulus. Just passed, you probably heard about it in the news. Uh, we're still waiting on the signature, so the money's not quite there yet. Uh, but what they've approved is over four, uh, $484 billion to businesses again. And the way that they broke it down, and actually I think it's, it may not be enough in my opinion, but they've allocated another $310 billion towards the payment protection program. So if you have employees, they're going to be able to help you with two and a half times your monthly um, payroll expenses and so forth to help support your staff. So, so that's out there. It's, it's a very good program. The next part that they have is kind of the emergency injury disaster relief program. Uh, it could be up to $10,000, very small, but it's a 100% forgivable loan. So if you qualify for it, um, which is very easy to qualify, just you have to send an SBA application. Again, we have those links in the executive summaries if you need them, but you can apply. If you're self-employed and you have two employees, they might give you two grand. Uh, but again, $2,000 that you don't have to pay back is still oxygen, you know? You can help pay with as much as you can. The next part that they had to re-up on was on hospitals. They put $75 billion towards that uh, to continue to, again, help to fight this, this illness and make sure that they have all the equipment and all the stuff going on. Um, now, if you can imagine, and I don't remember the exact numbers, John, but it was astronomical. I want to say they did like $70 billion in last year, SBA combined, in all their programs. And just imagine they had to do $377 billion just in PPP in a week. I mean, this is, their staffing is re, it just insane. And you can talk more about PayPal later because I, I think that's, they've been innovative. But they're allocating $2.1 billion just in administrative aid to be able to support uh, the releasing of this money quick enough. Uh, and then the last part is $25 billion in testing so that they can make sure they have the adequate re resources to identify and see who's infected so that we can uh, basically protect our people as quickly as possible. Once they know, the more tests they do, the more they can prevent the spread of the disease. So they're, they're doubling down on that. So that's in essence where the money's flowing uh, or that will be flowing once it's executed and the, the agreement is signed by Trump. Yeah, that's a great slide right there. It gives people, you know, um, a good overview yeah. of what's, what's going on. Thank you. Yeah. And you talked about PayPal, which is interesting. That's one thing I'll say is the administration is being very innovative, just letting businesses just double down on what they're good at. Right. I mean, what, tell, tell us that. I thought that was so cool. Yeah. So I didn't, you know, we, we got approved through your bank, right? So we went through that process and then I was uh, with a, an investor and lender yesterday and we were talking and he got two of his companies got two of his three got the PPP um, money and it all happened relatively quick. And I asked him who he used and he said, Oh, I used PayPal. And I said, PayPal is doing this. He said, Oh, oh yeah, it was a really seamless process. Uh, you know, it took two days to get approved and one day to get your money. Well, that, you know, that's I, all I could think is, all right, they had their processes in place and uh, just streamlined it. Right. So it's, yeah, it was impressive how fast he got it. So I, if I would have known that, 
originally probably would have went that route because I yeah. mean, pretty quick, right? So yeah. Anyways, but uh, re regardless, we got it. Uh, we're happy. I'm in uh, entrepreneurs organization. A lot of people did not get it, and that yeah. really really need it right now. So it's, you know, I feel fortunate that that we we did receive it. Absolutely. You know, I'm on several boards right now that like donations are down and we, we try to help them, but they're approved, but they're in that little limbo right now and they're struggling. I mean, it, it is a serious situation and, um, and they want to keep their people, but obviously there's a balance, right? How do you do that? So, but yeah, so this is coming. So if you don't have that money, you haven't applied, I would highly encourage you to be proactive about it as quickly as possible. So uh, now, uh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Rick. So I'm seeing a, uh, you, you, you guys are asking questions. We're going to go through and answer these for you guys. We're just uh, going to wait till the end and we'll go through. Is that okay? Yep. Yeah, I'm totally fine with continuing whatever, whatever you need. So, okay, per perfect, perfect. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about is some of you guys may be saying, well, listen, I'm a 1099. I'm an agent. I don't have employees to worry about. How do I get any financial support? So we talked about one of the other programs where they might give you up to 10,000. The other way is really, like I said, a lot of people are applying for unemployment. So what I want to do is give you a visual. So what they're saying is you got to go to your state level uh, unemployment office or online, obviously, and you would apply for unemployment, whether you necessarily needed it or not. Okay. So if you're an agent, for example, or you're a wholesaler and you're 1099 and you used to do five deals a month and now you got one, then obviously you've been impacted by this coronavirus. And so uh, again, we, in that executive summary, we give you a list of what qualifies and how you would be able to apply. But what the government did again is said, hey, listen, whether you are unemployed because you got fired or whether you just need this kind of a, uh, assistance program for the PUA is what they call it, apply. So once you apply, if you truly are unemployed, what they're going to do is they'll approve you for whatever that state level support maximum is. And then you will also qualify for the PUA program, which is about 39 weeks. They pay about $600 per week all the way up to July 31st of 2020. So that's step one. So if you're truly unemployed, you should be extremely aggressive about applying for unemployment and make sure that once you get approved at the state level, you're requesting for them to get you approved for the PUA level, which is the government support program that they have. Now, if you're denied because you're truly not eligible for true unemployment, you can still continue to request a PUA program. I would even put that in all the comments that you possibly can in your online application. And that way, when they see it, they'll immediately bypass you and put you into the actual PUA program. So in essence, there's over, I forgot how many millions of dollars or billions that are being allocated for this. So some of you in sales that are commission only 1099s and some of you with jobs that maybe they dropped your, your, your they dropped you part-time or whatever it is, you should be applying to get some support uh, financially and some oxygen. So this is definitely gonna happen. Uh, after this, they've even created a provision for an additional 13 weeks of about $600 per week. Uh, that provision is based, of course, you have to keep applying and requesting it. But just want you to know that on an individual level, the government has already really stepped into to try to help out. So be patient. As we just talked earlier, 25, 30 million people applying, and now you know why, because of the support program that's available. And, and it is important to be proactive about it for sure. Okay. All right, so yeah, let's go through this. this is what I touched on in the beginning. You are one of the few lenders still uh, loaning money. So what's your criteria and how have you changed, how have this, or excuse me, how has this changed for you as far as lending, your lending criteria? Things yeah, like that? yeah, so I mean, we're one of the few, uh, where we're fortunate is again, we danced a little bit with Wall Street to have additional products, but we didn't marry Wall Street. And so what it allowed us to do is those channels that shut down, we didn't have to worry about warehouse lines. It was our investor money. So right. we, so what we did is instead of just, you know, and we also don't have a limited capital like Wall Street does. So what we've had to do is get a lot more conservative about the deals we want to do and um, to really build alliances, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but really what we did is we went back to the core fundamentals of private lending that were there before this whole market blew up in the first place. So I'm going to share with you uh, something important and I want you to look at this quote. It's still true today, right? And this is Warren Buffett, the number one investor in history. He says, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. And I really believe that in this particular climate, the ones that were greedy <laughs> during the upside are the ones that are fearful during the downside. 
And this is when investors need to be more aggressive. That's why we're educating our passive investors. We're educating our borrowers. We're doing what we can to position ourselves to capitalize right now. Because right now is an amazing time to be doing business. Now, it's also not to be the craziest liberal investor because you will lose your shirt if you're not careful. Uh, not every investor is created equal. Not everybody's a John, right? And so you're going to have other clients that I probably wouldn't want to lend to right now because I don't think they have the, the wherewithal or the, or the skill to do it. So I'm going to give you the five pieces. If you're going to present any investment opportunity to any private lender today, including me, what you need to understand is that until there's more certainty in the marketplace, meaning the coronavirus is under control, and the second piece, Wall Street money starts slowly coming back, what you're going to see is more conservative investment opportunities for us. That means a lender is going to be more conservative and the cost of money is going to be more expensive. Why? Because our cost of money is more expensive, right? And so for that reason, you can already anticipate that we'll be more conservative and you'll be more expensive. So that's going to automatically force you to either walk away from the game or you also double down and start working on uh, being more conservative as well and negotiating better deals. So the first piece that I'm going to say is number one component is about how safe is my money. And that begins with the security instrument. So the biggest question my underwriting team is asking right now, and even our passive investors are, okay, how solid is this property really? What are my loan to values? We have created tiers for our investors based on experience, their credit, their liquidity, and so forth, and the deal itself. And based on that is how we're going based off of our loan to values. Uh, so again, loan to values are going to be more aggressive and it has to be in an active market. So what do I mean by that? Uh, I will say that right now we have a slowdown, if not completely stopped funding for most rural markets. It doesn't mean I don't like rural, but what it means is in that market, there's not enough activity to support a transaction. So I need to know that my client is going to be able to take care of his business. Otherwise he's going to default on me and I don't want a house in the middle of nowhere. So again, we're being more selective about what market this is in. Is it active? Is your business taking place, loan to value, and how solid the deal is? The next piece is the strength of the borrower. That's another very big factor. Now, before you would hear, because it was Wall Street, hey, what's your credit score? So credit score is important, but it's irrelevant in comparison to how many deals have you done the last 24 to 36 months? How many deals have you successfully completed? How much liquidity do you have? Do you have interest reserves, or do you barely have 10% to put down in a deal? Because that will distinguish the difference between somebody who's solid and somebody who's just barely, you know, bootstrapping a deal together to try to make it work. Um, mm -hmm. Down payment again is skin in the game. It's going back to the old ways of proving that you're serious. The next piece is multiple exit strategies. We want to see a clear path to pay off. We want to know that you're going to make money. We're not going to finance somebody that's like, well, I'm going to try to sell it. Uh, if you don't have a plan A, B, C, and D, we're not going to fund you because we don't feel that there's an exit strategy. So for us, on the high-end retail sector of luxury real estate, we're not funding anything over $350,000 in most markets. There might be some other markets we'll make an exception because the norm there is like a million. So, you know, 500 grand and a million, it's, you know, still relatively affordable. But we wanna make sure that it's a place that if you have to rent it for a period of time, it will cash flow, it'll pay our bills, right? And so that's imperative. Uh, so again, a clear path to pay off. Don't come to a, a lender asking for a loan if you don't have a clear path to pay them off. Otherwise, that, that's not gonna fly. The next piece, of course, is the term of the investment. You know, we talked about 30 year loans, we had them, guess what, they're gone, because only Wall Street buys that stuff. So you're not gonna see the low rates in 30 years for a while till they come back. So everything's gonna be more based on short term. For me, that means 12 months, and based on performance. Okay, if you're performing, you got a clear path, you've been doing your thing, but now you want an extension, then we're gonna sit down and analyze, okay, we'll give you a year. We'll give you two years, depending on what's going on. So you can anticipate most lenders with real money, they're not gonna be excited about giving you a five-year loan. This is not gonna happen. They're gonna be looking at 12 months. Some are even going down to six months to that point right now uh, and only giving six months. Another thing to note, and we're doing this as well with many of our clients, uh, we are requiring, depending on the deal, to hold back six months of interest reserves. So they're prepaying their interest up front so that we can make sure that they're fully committed in the deal and that we're gonna receive our debt service. And, and a lot of lenders are doing that right now. At least, I say a lot, but there's only a few that I actually know that are actually closing right now. Uh, and then the last part is risk versus reward. That's when we're looking at a higher yield, higher, uh, you know, higher return. Right? We have a cost of capital. So what you'll notice is that's the last thing from my mind. The first thing on my mind is, is the deal good? Does it make sense? The second thing is, do I like the borrower? Do I feel safe with the borrower? The third thing is, hey, are there multiple exit strategies? 
Then the fourth thing is, hey, I still want to do it in a short period of time. Then we talk about, okay, now what is my rate of return? So I've talked and collaborated with several groups. One of them literally, I, I'm actually, hopefully one day I'll be at their level. Uh, they've got over two and a half, three billion dollars of their own money raised privately, which is incredible. Um, they have nine private placement offerings. They've been doing this for a long time. They, they're not even doing cash out refis at all across the board. They just refuse, which is interesting to see. Uh, but I know that when the market was very aggressive, their average loan rate on a short-term bridge for like a flip, let's say, for example, uh, was going around 9.9. .9. Uh, their starting rate now is almost 12. And that's, you know, that's just the name of the game. So anticipate a higher rate, probably from the 10 being on the low end, if you're really good at what you do and the numbers make sense, all the way up to 15% is what I'm going to be anticipating looking at different scenarios. So again, this hopefully gives you a big picture of what you need to be considering as an investor. But also, when you come to pitch an investor that's going to lend you money, you got to make sure you hit these five boxes. Otherwise, you're probably going to lose them in confidence with investing with you. I don't know, John, if you want to chime in on that. Yeah, it's, it's, I often, um, through different cycles, think about it and talk about it more like turning on or off the, the spigot for, uh, uh, for water, right? Like mm -hmm. you, when things are really good, you turn that all the way up and you're taking all that volume in because you could disperse it. But when times are like this, we're in a time of uncertainty. And so, you know, no one has it exactly figured out when we pivot out of this. So just like you guys would do, lenders are gonna do, and, and you guys buying are gonna do, you're gonna, you're gonna pull back and be a little bit more reserved until you feel comfortable about like, okay, now there's a plan on getting out of this and we're starting to navigate through it and we're seeing things work as far as uh, next steps, right? So. When you guys look at this, the, the, there's the good and the bad, right? If you go back to the, the Warren Buffett slide, if you guys are in, in here capitalizing on some of these opportunities, you know, I, I know Rick's here to talk about lending. Well, what about assuming people's mortgages, you guys, at crazy low rates, historically three, four percent. And, you know, remember this in future slides when we're talking about uh, you know, inflation and stuff like that. But if you're able to assume some of these, um, you know, great. That way, you know, you're able to still take advantage of deals and you can look at the multiple exit strategies as well, or just finding what other people aren't doing, right? So a lot of people not jumping in the market. You're, you know, the, the good and the bad news is, yeah, lending's tighter. Uh, that's the bad news. The good news is, is there's less people playing in the game. That's for sure. Exactly. I'm seeing it as well, like, you know, it's dried up as far as other players out there looking, um, you know, are there still people out there? Yeah, but I'm not necessarily running into them as far as competition goes, but I do see them looking at deals. So anyways, kind of just food for thought, you guys. Um, you know, you want to, these lenders are kind of giving you a roadmap of how to navigate through it as well, because, you know, they're protecting their investments. They're going to be solid about it. You guys should be thinking the exact same way too. And if they're not looking at this deal, you should probably not look at it as well. I mean, that's just the truth. What was a deal, you know, six weeks ago isn't a deal today. You right. Know? 100%. It is, but odds are it's probably not a deal. Right. So, yep. um, just the landscape's changing, so yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. And you're right, there's a lot of creative ways to do it. And, and you know what's crazy, in our space, in Orlando specifically, there's a lot of wholesaling going on. And I've been preaching this forever, like look, if you're gonna wholesale, great, make some money. But what I can't stand is when a wholesaler is trying to make 40, 50, $60,000 to sign over a contract for somebody and they don't want the customer to know, of course. Uh, so those, some of those guys that actually frustrate me have been reaching out to our office because they know we buy real estate too. And they're like, look, we'll do it for 500 bucks now. Just, we'll just assign it to you. You pay 500 bucks and it's your deal. Because again, a lot of the, the buyers that were speculators more than investors are out. They've been wiped out. So there's a lot of great opportunities right now to really get involved. And so, but, but like John said, you have to be conservative, right? You have to make sure it's a right deal. And if a lender is going, mm, I don't know, you probably should be thinking that too. Well, what am I not seeing? So maybe, maybe I should look for the other opportunities that are out there to, to capitalize. Yeah, good stuff. Thank you for going over this. I mean, this way people understand at least what, what's going on inside of, you know, a lender's head and why do they, I mean, obviously they need to protect themselves. You guys, this will be the tightest it gets, but if you're in there finding deals as you guys sift through them, 
and you're in this market and you stay in it, things will loosen up and you'll find more and more opportunities. So try Absolutely. to build that relationship with these lenders now. So 100%. Okay. So let's go through this next one that we were getting. So can social distancing really have an effect on our economy and the future growth and why? Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question that we've had. And, and to be honest with you, you probably heard in the media, Hey, this is the first time we've heard the word social distancing and, and chances are, I mean, it's been a very long time, but this is not a, a new word per se. Maybe it's been a hundred years now, but uh, it's happened in the past. And that's kind of want to give you perspective. Before, before I go into the, the big stats and show you what an impact it had, I want you to think about, and again, any loss of life is not acceptable to me. It's, it's heartbreaking, right? But I want you to think about the coronavirus now is over a couple of million people infected. Several hundred thousand people have passed away. Horrifying numbers worldwide. But now imagine when I read these numbers to you, if this is what we were dealing with today, imagine what our economy would look like if these were the numbers. So now go back to 1918. There's this pandemic that takes place. Over 500 million people within 18 months are infected with the influenza virus. That's literally one third of the world's population at the time. So just picture that number today. One third of our population will be impacted by this. Over 50 million people passed away within just a matter of less than two years from this infection. So think about it, that's a 10% death rate. Imagine if we had a 10% death rate right now, our entire world would be locked down and I mean, our entire economy would be over with. And to give you perspective of those 50 million people, 675,000 of those people were in America. Now, I don't, I don't know if you understand this, we're talking thousands of people dying daily and people are literally having anxiety attacks, right? Because they can see it now, social, uh, social media has made it very available for everybody. What if you were close to a million people a week dying? Just think about those numbers. That is mind boggling to me. The reason why I'm really hyping this up, because I want you to gain the perspective is, this happened 100 years ago. This happened in America and worldwide, and we're still here today. So the point I want to make, guys, is this too will pass. And I pray it isn't as bad as this, but I want you to gain perspective. It's happened in the past. So what the heck does it have to do with social distancing? Let me give you an example. In the very beginning of this, New York, which the irony is obviously they learned from their past history, <laughs> but um, when the pandemic hit, New York was the, one of the few first uh, states that actually locked down their borders. In fact, within 11 days before the deaths began to spike. So they literally locked down and they lowered their rates and they were able to take control of this influenza virus in less than 12 weeks. So in less than 12 weeks from the pandemic starting to really hit, they took control. Look at St. Louis. St. Louis didn't take it as serious. They had a spike. They tried to stop it, but they loosened up their guidelines with social distancing. So they had yet another ramp up, which is what we don't want. And obviously, it took them substantially more time to get a hold and under control with this particular pandemic. So even though it sounds crazy that we're right now uh, video chatting instead of a live event, the reality is by us being responsible, each and every one of us actually have a huge part in whether our economy is going to get back to business in the next couple of weeks or if we're going to revisit this mistake in a few months because we weren't responsible. So it is imperative that we look at that. And I want to show you a visual of how big that number really is. Look at the curves right now. This is, these are actual stats showing us the projections that by June, all the death rates are going to be dropping substantially. And that's important for us to see that. So we're already having an impact. We just have to be patient. We have to be responsible. And we should be using this downtime to actually reposition ourselves. If you're not growing, if you get out of this whole thing and you didn't grow, build a new strategy in your business, modify, you wasted this incredible, a precious time that you have right now. Uh, if you don't bond with your kids and spend more time with your family, and it's on you. Shame is on you because this has been an amazing opportunity to really be responsible, stop these debts, but also reposition yourself to be more successful. And I'll give you a visual. This is a massive number. For those that don't know GDP, I sometimes take it for granted. So it represents the gross domestic product. Basically, it measures the total value of financial goods and services produced within a given country's borders. Uh, it is literally the most popular method of measuring an economy's output and is therefore considered a measure of the size of an economy. So what you're looking at here, and I want you to really pay close attention and how this is impacting our social distancing. These were the numbers that we had, right? That pre-coronavirus, this is what was expected to take place 2020. It was actually a decent year. But because of this whole pandemic, you can see not only the models of the down scenarios, 
but the current numbers are pretty darn close. This is the drop, the drastic drop that we're having. But what are they projecting? They're projecting by 2021, if we can actually do the social distancing correctly, and we, we put a nip in this thing and control it, they're anticipating an exponential growth much higher to ramp up because our economy was so strong. So what I wanna challenge you is, what you do here during this phase will determine where you end up in this side of the cycle by 2021. It's yeah. pretty- John, I don't know if you want- No, sorry. I, I, I mean, all, all of this information is incredible. So uh, I appreciate like all this stuff that, I mean, a lot of t- you guys, I've been on a lot of calls no one's put together the information like you've put it together. So thank, thank you. you for doing this. Ser- ser- seriously, like some big companies have put on some uh, calls and just going through it. Nothing's been this detailed and, and thank you. people understand it. So thank you for doing that for. Yeah, no worries. I, well, I'm honored to be here. And that's part of the goal is to add value, man. So I mean, we have a few more things, but uh, feel free and then we'll jump into the Q and A's. Yeah, you guys, in, in like Ricardo, I see your question. We're going to get into that in a second. Like all you guys, I want to answer your guys' questions and we will. So, um, and they're great questions. And so some of you guys that are on a time crunch, if you could just bear with us and, and hear some of this stuff, because I think it's, uh, I think it's important information for you guys to know. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so here's another question that we've been getting. So what do you suggest as an investor uh, should be doing during this crisis to position themselves for future growth and how to be successful? So, uh, yeah, I mean, we kind of started going through that. And the last one is, is obviously understanding the market. But please go, go uh, if you could go into that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've been sharing some nuggets, right? You know, get some oxygen. The next thing is really redefine your criteria so that you can be, you know, safe in your investments. The next thing is really forming strategic alliances. And, and I think you're in this call, you're in great hands. Uh, but what I want to give you a quick story, and I think this will put it in perspective. This gentleman that you see on the screen, his name is Charles Plum. He was a very highly decorated jet fighter pilot in Vietnam. Uh, in fact, he flew 75 combat missions. He was a very, very uh, respected man. Unfortunately, in his 75th mission, he was shot down, and he actually somehow survived, and he landed in enemy territory in Vietnam. So he ended up being a prisoner for over six years in a very tiny cell made out of bamboo. And every single day for those six years, the only thing that kept him going was believing that his brothers and sisters in arms would move heaven and earth to get him out. Literally, there were days that he thought about just killing himself and he would remind himself, no, my brothers and sisters, they're going to get me out of here. Sure enough, they kept their word. They bartered, they negotiated, they finally get him out. So finally, here's this man who's been in a tiny cell for six years. He's finally freed and he goes back and he goes back to what he calls his norm, right? He's got this PTSD going on. So he goes to this little coffee shop he used to go to, a little diner. He goes in and he sits down by himself and he starts thinking, man, it's just been a week since I've been here. This world has changed. You know, he's he's going through a a series of emotions. And while he's sitting there, a gentleman comes by as he's finishing his coffee and, and he's like, hey, you're Mr. Charles Plum, aren't you? And he's like, yeah. He doesn't recognize the guy. And he's like, yeah, I am. And he's like, well, looks like it worked. And he's like, what do you mean what worked? And he's like, looks like your parachute worked. He's like, you're, you're alive. I heard you got shot down in Vietnam. And he's like, uh, yeah, I did. And he's like, how did you know that? And he says, I'm the guy who packed your parachute. And so needless to say, as they were sitting down, he invited them for dinner and they talked a little bit further. And this was the biggest picture that he got in his mind. After that whole conversation with this man, he realized there was a guy nobody knew who bes- bes- beside him on the scenes was literally working diligently to make sure that all the fighter pilots had the right parachute. So I want to flip it on you and ask you this question. During this time, who's packing your parachute? Who's the person that you can count on that could be your ally that can empower you and help you to succeed? And so as a company right now for us and working with amazing guys like John and Trent, like this organization is here and we're committed to help you be successful. And you really need to take advantage of those resources because at the end of the day, I don't care how smart we think we are, part of us bringing value to you is because we have such an amazing team. We have an amazing alliance of team members that help us to put things like this together for you and help you. So I really want to challenge you during this time, this is a time that we can leverage and develop strong alliances that make us stronger, better, more productive, more profitable. Uh, To give you a picture, as a company, Uh, We really have taken this model alone. We can do so little. Together, we can do so much. 
And we've actually started working with other institutions and lenders, building our own network of alliances. We're working with other referral partners. So we've actually, in the last couple of weeks, we built this crazy referral partner program so that all of our clients can now, literally by clicking a button and sending somebody through, they can sign up clients that need a loan and they automatically get paid for it. I mean, we've just started building alliance portals for these people, uh, our acquisition structures, other hedge funds we partner with and investors. We're just really focused right now on building some very powerful strategic alliances that help us to be more productive. Because at the end of the day, think about it from this perspective. Most of us on a traditional month, like let's say the month of April, we're so busy working in the business that we never work on the business. And so this has really created a lot of space, a lot of time for us to say, where can I get better? Who can I bring to my team that can make my organization more effective, much better? And sometimes it's not about hiring somebody, it's about building a partnership, an alliance with somebody that you can trust. And so I think this has been a huge piece. I know, John, you've been doing this too. Uh, but again, I really believe this is an amazing time. This is what you should be doing right now is building the right alliances with lenders that are funding, with investors, building a solid cash buyer base. Because anybody who transacts today, if you're wholesaling, is going to be transacting later and they're real. And so now you have a real buyer's book of business instead of these phony people that were straw buyers for most people. You know what I mean? Right. Um, I don't know if you want to hit this one. I mean, we're literally almost done. I don't know if you want to knock into this or chime into that or. It, it's uh, what I, well, let's talk about this one. We're rolling right into it, but uh, yeah, I, I'll just touch on that last one. Uh, what you said kind of yeah. struck me and that was, you guys, when you start finding people that are doing deals currently or lending currently, those are not your fly by night people that kind of jumped in here at the last minute. They're the people that probably made it through the last downturn and came out and flying, you know, with flying colors. Uh, on the last downturn, um, I did better than any other time I've ever done because there's very little competition and you guys could jump in and get pretty creative in the way that you guys acquire and take down properties. Um, anyways, so, but building, but building your team, building your network, uh, building your, your um, arsenal of, you know, it's your network, right? And, and those are going to be the people that if you're working with them now and they're still in doing this, they're going to be doing it in the future. Just like you said, it's, it's Absolutely. just things that, uh, um, yeah, during the downturn, I still work with those exact same people and uh, they did very well as, as well. So anyways. Yeah, absolutely. This next one is pretty interesting. This next slide, if we could touch on that. Yeah, we're, we're, we're gonna focus on the good part of this. <laughs> um, but, but just to kind of give you guys perspective, what you're looking at here, we don't have to go into too much detail, but you can see kind of the impacts of COVID and the previous recessions. But what I want you to see is this massive picture here. It says basically the debt projections that will exceed our economy output. So if you can imagine in the news in 2007, all the way to 2000, actually 2008 to 2011, all of the economists, all the financiers, everyone was complaining about their fear. It was in the media of how are we gonna pay back these trillions of dollars that the government owes that we can't afford it. And we were at 35%. Well, if you look at these numbers, we're expecting to exceed over 107%, which means that long-term, even though the short-term this puts oxygen in our lungs, long-term, somebody's gotta pay for this debt. Somehow this has to be reduced. And usually when you have a situation like this where we cannot afford to pay what we owe based on income that we generate, you're gonna deal with an inflationary market. Now, I don't expect there to be some crazy, you know, like you hear from some of those countries in Africa where they had hyperinflation and guys are going with like wheelbarrows of money just to buy you know, a gallon of milk. I don't expect there to be something that crazy, but the reality is there's only a few ways that you deal with inflation. And, and obviously in an inflationary market, which we can expect in the future because of these circumstances, we really have to start thinking smart about what are we holding and, and real estate being an incredible tangible asset that benefits when there's an inflationary market. So that's a, that's a great thing for us. But I don't know, John, if you want to chime in on that. Yeah, I mean, so, I kind of expected last time in 2008, uh, nine, when we had to get that stimulus money, I expected to see some inflation as well or hyperinflation. And we didn't necessarily see it, but uh, there were some other things working in the background that kept that right. So it's interesting to see like, what is, uh, 
what will be those drivers and will we see it this time around? And right. how do you protect yourself? And, you know, knowing that if you have real estate, especially real estate that's been locked in on conventional stuff at like 4%, you guys, three, 4%. And if you're able to acquire some of these properties at that rate, I mean, you know, in the nineties, we had interest rates in the high teens. Mm -hmm. So could you imagine just having that spread? If you just acquired people's mortgages during, uh, you know, um, hysteria, during panic, people get themselves in a pinch and then you're able to act as a bank to other people in the future, collecting the spread. And if you were like, yeah, I'll finance you at <laughs> not 19%, I'm gonna give you a discount at 17. Anyways, there's a lot of different ways to look at it. If we do go into that inflation, um, you know, some people will say buy gold, buy silver, things like that. I look at stuff as a cash flow, as monthly cash flow. So, and I think that's how most of us live. In fact, we're kind of um, right now seeing people's models that have uh, issues with their business models by not having that cash flow come in. Maybe they were stretched thin and I don't want to sit here and divert and go off into that. But looking at this, yeah, wow. I mean, that's, this is, um, this is big, right? Yeah. So yeah, if last time we were at 35 and we're projecting, you know, 107 and we're, you know, our unemployment keeps growing and, you know, um, yeah. Do you, do you want to talk about this? <laughs> I mean, what I would just say is if you're a real estate investor, you should be thinking about a portfolio. You shouldn't be looking at this one trick pony thing. You should be looking at how do I establish cash flow? One of the benefits of small commercial with John, you specialize in is there's so many ways that you can assume mortgages. There's so many ways that you can uh, creatively finance your projects. Uh, but the benefit, in fact, I'll give you one picture of a hyperinflation. One of my really good friends about, I think I want to say it was like 17, almost 20 years ago, they own a rental property in Mexico and they went through a really bad uh, situation where the country hit this hyperinflation. Now, again, I don't suspect the U S to even be anywhere near as bad as that, but he had a fixed mortgage on his property and he had some tenants and because inflation went so high, he increased the rents of course to mark, you know, to match inflation and long story short within literally less than like, I think I want to say it was almost within the first year of that inflationary year, he paid off his mortgage and owned the property free and clear. Yeah. And so, uh, again, as an investor, if you have a portfolio strategy, uh, start doing it now because obviously inflation is not going to hit tomorrow morning. It'll probably take a few years before you start seeing any ripple effect, but we should be wise now to position ourselves to, to maximize in the future because it is going to have an impact. The question is just how big is it? So I'm going to, I'm going to go through some of these questions. If you don't mind, I'm just yeah, let's go, let's go. And what, if I can just plug this in guys, this is the website. You oh, do sorry. have to doubt www rickmiller.com forward slash forecast, just because I want to get you guys the economic forecast. I'm also giving you a direct link as John and I uh, have been talking about it with a book I wrote called Investing with a Purpose. It's a video audio, so you can just watch it. Hopefully it inspires you and it's a blessing to you. If you enjoyed this content, I'm hoping you'll enjoy the book as well. Uh, but yeah, let's go into the questions, John, because uh, it's well, one of Real quick, because this is answering some of the people's questions was how to get this information. Oh. Oh, okay, cool. Perfect. You guys, so there it is. you can get the info right there. Yeah. Just, uh, just I'll, I'll give you guys, let's keep it on the slide. So people sure. can, um, okay, perfect. So people could grab that information. So I'm just going to, um, read through these. So is this reducing interest for us investors? Um, I'm, so I'm not sure what that was. Um, yeah. Um, I would say, if you're, if you're borrowing money, it's probably not going to reduce your interest. It'll probably increase it unless if you're assuming a mortgage from somebody that's struggling financially, like John alluded to, that's still a very viable thing subject to use. Uh, if you're going to go to private money, anticipate a higher interest rate. Now, with that said, because there aren't a lot of people buying right now, you can also anticipate that you'll be able to negotiate better deals. So your cash on cash return, if you were at a 15 or whatever, 16% cash on cash return on a flip, for example, you might be looking at 25, 30% return on your money on some of those deals. And so just be, be a little bit more greedy as, as Buffett would say on your deals and, and you will make a much bigger margin for yourself. Right. Here's uh here's the next one. Uh, will we be getting into a buyer's market? The answer is, and this is kind of an interesting thing, higher end in long-term, it is going to be going in a massive buyer's market because again, if you look at any conventional financing options that are still viable right now, they all have to comply with FHA VA within the community. So there's only a cap 
really, really for, for some of those programs. Anything after, you know, in some markets, anything after 400 grand, it, you, you have guys, to deal with couple loans. Yeah, and anytime we have market uncertainty, even people that qualify currently are sitting on the sidelines waiting to see what happens. So, you know, the fact is, is that you get investors, you get people that are desperate to sell, and we are seeing people do um, some desperate selling right now. So mm -hmm. even right now, you can get some really good deals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yep, I agree. Um, yeah, I'm seeing some multifamily stuff that was listed really high. And now that person's cash flow is, you know, shrinking dramatically to where they're just literally dumping it just to get out so they could make, you know, the rest of their payments on other stuff. So, yeah, or, or not that payment. So, mm -hmm. Um, here's the next one. We're, uh, we were planning to buy a home just as COVID hit. Uh, it's been on holds. Uh, should we be looking while prices are low or should we, should we wait a while? If we wait approximately, how long should we, should we wait? I mean, as long as your financing is contingent on the only products that are available, I would say try to buy now. You're going to get some really cheap rates. Uh, I got I have a buddy in the retail sector we work with. I mean, he's clocking some like record interest rates. I think he had a client at 2.75 the other day. Crazy interest rates. Um, but again, understand that the retail lending space as of right now, they're not doing you know, uh, traditional loans like non-qualified mortgages. So you're not gonna get a bank statement loan is what I'm saying in the retail. So if you qualify for FHA, VA, those kind of products that the, the government's buying, then yeah, go for it. Be aggressive, try to get a property right now under contract and get your financing at the lowest rates possible. I, I would absolutely be doing that. Yeah, uh, and I'm going to second that. I would say, you know, find those deals because right now we're, we have this window in time to find some phenomenal deals. <clears throat> That's not to say that we won't see more phenomenal deals, but your interest rate as well, I think capitalizing on it, you know, I, I would, uh, I mean, I'm out there. I, I'm selling mine at, uh, I'm selling a lot of stuff but it was already being positioned to sell, but I'm also looking to buy as well. And I like that I'm not running into people in the deals that I'm seeing are deals. So right. uh, uh, jump in you guys. Um, and, and that's, I'm saying it and, and I'm not just telling you guys in theory, this is stuff that I'm doing currently. Mm -hmm. so, no, I agree. Uh, let's see here. So <laughs> when you say, when you say uh, the, the PPP money is dried up, does that mean if someone were to apply for a grant now, it's it's not likely you will get the grant. Um, yeah, it, it, it's kind of, we're kind of in a little situation. I mean, it, I would say you if you still qualify under the program and you apply, apply right now. They're about to get an infusion of capital. Most of, I mean, if we were to go back to that visual, um, and in fact, I may do that if you don't mind. Give me just one second because I, I think it'll help to visualize it real quick. Okay, so give me just one second. All right, so, all right, here we go. Uh, if you want to turn it back on for me, that'll be great. Um, so can you guys see the screen? Uh, Brandon, can you help with this? Um, I can try to share myself, but I just didn't. Here it is, let me see here. Here it is, I'll do it right now. Do you have it? Oh, there I you think go. I do, yep, here it is. Okay. Okay, yeah. All right, so if you look at this particular section here, uh, you guys can see it now, right? <clears throat> So um, of all the applications that you're seeing here, um, they're going to be infusing in this particular emergency relief fund, 60 additional billion dollars. Now remind, just to remind you, this is 100% forgivable, but it's up to $10,000 and it's usually based on how many employees you have. So that's like the quick emergency fund. They're taking applications, but what they basically said is we don't have the money yet. So until we get it, we can't release it. So it'll probably take a couple of, probably I would say about a week or two before it actually becomes liquid, meaning the SBA has the money to release it. So I would absolutely apply if you can. As far as the, the PPP program, because again, these kind of two are kind of connected. Uh, this program, I would just get immediately with your banker. Uh, all the money that I talked about earlier has already been allocated and people are still waiting for their money because there's a pipeline. That's a lot of money to be dispersing between companies. But there's a new round of about 310 billion that I can assure you is gonna go away probably within a week. So right now I'd be trying to connect with the right bankers, the right people to get the application, get your financials and all the stuff you need to get done so that you're in queue for the next round of capital. 
You guys, this is so important. The people that aren't getting it did not get their stuff in time. So please yep. get your, you know, get everything in now, even if you don't think it's going to happen because, um, I mean, the odds are if you get your stuff in and you're working with a good lender or bank, um, like Wells Fargo and stuff like that um, has been telling a lot of our EO people to go find another lender, right? So yeah. maybe working with a smaller or even PayPal or some of these other ones. Uh, and, you know, Rick has some really good resources that work for me. So maybe reaching out to him and uh, maybe, anyways, I would just get your stuff in line, you guys. Um, yep. Be proactive for sure. Yeah. And, and you can email us if you want us to connect you with somebody. Just literally an email, shoot an email saying ppp at hiscapitalgroup.com. And what we'll do is we'll immediately forward that email and connect you directly with either a banker or one of our other contacts that has told us that they're going to be preparing for this next batch of capital. All right, and it on. was so bad, just for the record, it was so bad. They were so frustrated with the big banks that they literally have increased the limit uh, for the smaller banks. So the smaller banks are going to get more of this money than even the big banks at this point because uh, they just didn't roll up their sleeves. They were complaining that it was a pain for them. Yeah, well, I saw some of the bigger banks or um, companies also gave their, their money back. So we gave yeah. some of the smaller ones, which was good. Okay, let's, let's keep going. Uh, what what was the other, question? No, the other question? Untraditional paths to pay are, are there. I'm not sure what that was in regards to. Um, it, what untraditional paths to pay are there? I, I, we, I just don't know what, I'm sure it's, you know, if we were on that slide, it would make sense. It just doesn't, I guess. Okay. Uh, Feel free to chime in guys, whoever that was, feel free to elaborate. So maybe we'll get you on the last part. For, oh, so on your different levels. So uh, for point number two, what do us new investors bring confidence to a lender? Got uh, it. Yeah. That's a great question. You know how I talked about alliances? This is the time to have an alliance. This is the time to bring somebody in who has the experience. Maybe you have some of the down payment money. Maybe you have some of the credit. Uh, we are taking on, I'll tell you right now, there's several entities that before we just have a consent to act, but we just work directly with the one guy. Uh, in this case, we will have multiple members become guarantors for the loan. So one of the things you could do is bring in some of those experienced alliances to work with you, help you to oversee the project so that you can, in essence, use their experience to make the investors feel more comfortable. Because at the end of the day, that's what investors want to know. That's what I want to know is, are you going to be able to pay me back? Right. Do you have the experience to deal with a situation? It's like a joke that this guy told me, and he had a good point. He said, um, you can watch on YouTube how to do a full operation and how to remove somebody's appendix. You, you can literally watch it on YouTube step by step. He's like, the reason why doctor gets paid the big bucks is because when you start bleeding out, that's when the real experience kicks in. And so it's a good point, right? The same with real estate. Yeah, you know, yeah. you might think you know, but if you don't know what to do when it goes on fire, a real experienced guy is going to be seasoned and know what to do. It won't freeze. They'll actually take action. Good, good, uh, yeah, good analogy. All right. So next, uh, what do these circumstances mean for those of uh, us just getting started and investing and uh, doing our one-on-ones? Just keep doing your one-on-ones, you guys. Uh, I mean, I think Rick just kind of covered some of this, Ruth, but you you got to just keep going through your one-on-one. -on -one and, and when working with your coach, um, the one-on-one, -on -one, like when the analogy of bleeding out, like that's where your coach actually comes in. Uh, we'll be going through and navigating you guys through your purchases, your offers, all of it. So in multi multiple exit strategies. The model that Rick just went through uh, is the same model that we're gonna have you guys and typically have you guys follow anyways. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it, a new investor we, we are conservative with as well, no different than um, uh, a lender being conservative. So we, just like how we were talking about how you kind of shelter yourself from that, we do the exact same thing, so. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Uh, do you think there'll be a, a large increase in short sales and foreclosures in the near future? And what do you think banks will will uh, become more lenient on price point negotiation? Um, you want to take this one? 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we really don't have a full picture yet. Number one, they've pretty much restricted most of the consumer lending foreclosures, and they've almost forced everybody into forbearance agreements. Uh, so you could literally just send an email and the bank has to deal with your forbearance agreement if it's a retail loan. Hard money, not so much. So be careful, uh, you know, uh, confusing the two because we, we, we are helping some of our clients that really have a legitimate case and we have a process for that. Uh, but what I see is, I guess it all depends on how they're really establishing a forbearance agreement. So there's really a couple of ways to do it. And it, I guess it really will depend on which lender. So let me give you an example. If you can't pay your mortgage payment today because your finances have been impacted, or a consumer that you're gonna be dealing with. What ends up happening is, when you go and talk to them, there's really the first pitch that they're gonna give you is fine, you're approved, we're gonna take those two or three payments you can make for the next 60 to 90 days that you're approved for, but that means that come July, you're gonna to have to pay your mortgage payment plus you're gonna pay what you owe. And so if you couldn't pay before, unless if you're making additional income now, how are you gonna pay double? what you were not able to pay in the first place. So that is gonna create some issues. Um, one of the things that some lenders I've heard are gonna to try to do is to add it to the end of the loan, which is it's great because then at least you're coming back to square one, but not all lenders are doing that. So are we gonna see a, a spike in this? I, I think so. I think we're gonna see some foreclosures take place. Uh, that number will increase. I don't expect there to be some insane amount of foreclosures yet, but again, we're, we're watching the market right now. We're li literally seeing it unfold. And depending on how bad it gets now, that's what you can expect six months from now. That's when that ripple effect really begins to kick in. You guys also, we see before the foreclosures, we see the bankruptcy start to spike. So um, we'll see, you know, we already have a lot of people racking up debt. So we'll see how that kind of uh, plays out in the next, you know, three to six months of people mm -hmm. filing bankruptcies. That being said, as an investor yourself, you should be networking with bankruptcy attorneys are ready to pick up, um, you know, properties. So, um, yeah, it's just a, another avenue that everybody on this call should be looking at. So, um, increased short sales. Um, yeah, we're going to see increase in a lot of stuff, right? I mean, this is just the beginning of it. So, mm -hmm. for, and I know the question keeps coming up: Should we buy now? Should we buy later? Uh, buy now and buy later. How about that? I mean, kind of like when this, when a stock starts to slip, you buy that stock and you keep buying all the way down, right? It's, um, it's just one of those things you do. Um, but I would be looking for deals that um, are really good deals, deals that you could be making offers that hurt the person to take them. I, I mean that in a nice way. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, you're right. I mean, there, there's some people that they need help. You know, there's going to be some people that like they're, they're going to lose it anyway. And so they're in their mind. They're like, look, if you can help me, that's great. So I would say be about solutions and find ways to be creative. Uh, one of the opportunities, the biggest reason why we're going to have so much opportunity, and I'm surprised nobody's asked this yet, is those offer pads of this world, all these institutional buyers, where did that money come from in the first place? Wall Street. They're out right now until Wall Street figures this thing out. So again, you're going to have so much opportunity to really work deals and negotiate them. So uh, I would definitely encourage you. And, and kind of like John said, the real estate cycle doesn't tell you when to buy. It shows you how to buy within each stage. And so it's really all about positioning yourself right now. If you're not confident yet, if you're like, man, I just, I'm getting deals, but I'm afraid to pull the trigger, then start really marketing for legitimate cash buyers and transact with a few of them first. Get a couple of those deals kind of out of your system so that you feel confident, but uh, don't lose this opportunity. This is an opportunity for sure. So um, here's another one. Are there any residential deals that you would, uh, there, you guys, we have two different, we have a chat and Q and A. So I'm going to go, if I haven't read yours, I'll go back. I'm going to hit the other button here in a second. So are there any residential deals you would attack right now? For instance, I know that you said you should be building a portfolio for the future. So would you suggest on uh, using subject to strategy to take over mortgages and build your portfolio quickly? Sure. That's a great idea. I mean, that's a great way to start building quickly into a, into a portfolio of rental properties. You could do rent to own strategies right now. I mean, it, it, a lot of creative financing happens when the market is down. So be creative for sure. You guys, there's another strategy that uh, a lot of people aren't aware of, and maybe you guys do know about it, but it's uh, wholesale or lease options. And some people talk about the sandwich lease options, and I specifically like to talk about the 
wholesale lease option. So you get paid and then out of the deal and, and you're, you're gone versus waiting in the future to get paid on a deal or a transaction because you never know really how that's going to pan out. So getting paid up front and brokering those people, building your list of buyers and sellers, that is something that I think is going to come on strong because some of these people that are getting, uh, you know, out of a property forced may want to get back into a property, into the market as things kind of adjust downward and they'll want to take advantage of it and a place to call home. So if you're able to provide that for them, um, they'll pay that premium maybe and be able to pay you and you get, you, you're basically brokering that deal. So wholesale lease options, another, another one that will be popular in this model, mm -hmm. along with wholesaling and stuff like that. But uh, you're doing, you're essentially wholesaling to an end user. So, yeah. Uh, let's see here. Um, when do you feel the best time is to approach commercial real estate property owners to buy now or wait a few weeks all the time? <laughs> That's all the above, but especially right now, some of them have really been impacted by this uh, with some of their tenants saying, look, I need a forbearance and they still got a mortgage to pay in, in most cases. So you can really work out some, some deals right now too. So also on commercial real estate loans, if you bring in your lender and you're asking for a forbearance or anything like that, what they're going to do is keep a really tight eye or watch on you. Um, it's kind of like if you, it's the last thing you want to do is ask for that as a um, borrower on a commercial piece of property because you're basically welcoming in or waving the, the flag saying, hey, I'm having issues and they're going to watch you even and scrutinize you more. And, and you could have to monthly report everything to them and your P&Ls and do a bunch of, have to jump through a lot of hoops. They could potentially even, uh, if you dip below a certain percent, call that note due. And there's a lot of other stuff. So we're seeing some of this stuff happen right now. Um, um, so I would be, I mean, I'm always looking at commercial. So I, I think there's people always trying to exit out of it. So mm -hmm. Um, and a few people saw this happening beforehand, so I wouldn't even wait. Those people are, we have people doing fire selling, li literally. Um, I'll give you guys an example. I did, uh, I was going to do a deal downtown. It's office. I have a lot of office and it was, uh, the, some of you guys might've saw it. It's one, one, uh, 1 1.1 million in, in downtown Phoenix. Anyways, negotiated a deal. And then I, was going to leave the deal. And then they offered me uh, six months, no payments where I was going to pay them back. And they're going to carry the note at a 5% interest only for five years on this property. I backed out of that. And then they've sent me a, a message just saying, tell me what, what it would take to do this deal. So there's motivated people out there. Mm -hmm. Now This was a deal that had multiple offers on it. And since I backed out, nobody's touched it. So it goes to show you there's investors sitting on the sideline. Yeah. Uh, there's a couple things that I'm trying to move. And then once I move these, I'll jump back over to that deal and I'll offer them a substantial discount and I'll, um, I'll be looking for a year, no payment. Mm -hmm. Anyways, kind of food for thought. So, it's all right. Opportunity. Yeah, you guys, it's just how you negotiate, right? So you want to be able to negotiate these deals. And you, I would say the people selling now are probably some of your more motivated sellers um, versus, and they probably have equity, right? So they're able to get more creative with you versus some of the people that get pinched later, they don't have as much, as many options. So I would say jump in now. That was to Valerie. So, all right. Uh, where do you, where do you get your forecast? If, if you, uh, Don, if you send in that, um, um, can you bring back that your page so people could write down that information. Yeah, uh, give me one second. I'll be the where, where You get your information from a handful of places, right? You have your own economist, right? So yeah, we have our own economist that we brought on staff. So there's a variety of sources. Uh, we also have some tools specifically that we're using. Oh, sorry. There it is. Uh, so just literally you have to type in www.rickmalero.com forward slash forecast. Otherwise it acts up. So just put that there, fill out your name and email, and it'll automatically send you the forecast. That's, that's one of the things we have is a legitimate forecast prior to the crash. So you see all the core fundamentals and how strong the market and real estate was. 
you'll get all the executive summaries like we talked about uh, that talk about how to get to the PPP program, all the requirements and everything's there. Um, <clears throat> what, uh, so one of the things, so we have an economist that does the research, but we've also invested in some technology, specifically on the residential space. Commercial has some other tools too that has some really interesting data, um, but on the residential space, this other software that we, that we pay for uh, provides zip code data. So when we're analyzing a deal, it shows us all kinds of information regarding um, <clears throat> basically, is it a buyer's market, seller's market? What was the average days on the market last year versus now? What's active, what's not? It's a really, really broke, well broken down system and it gives you a for, uh, it's kind of a visual forecast per zip code to say what is the percentage of risk of this market actually going into a decline. And so we've seen how real estate is such a localized market that even though we're impacted, there's certain markets that are still in the green, like very growth, uh, uh, they're, they're poised for growth. And then there's other markets that you instantly start seeing the, the actual dial drop because it's a market that just doesn't have enough activity or it was too expensive so that market is frozen. So uh, we do a lot of research and we pay a lot of money for, for information like this. Uh, but again, I feel like it gives us an edge. Most of our competitors don't. They just go on the MLS and that's it, you know? Right. So but there's a lot of information to glean from. So here's a good one. This is uh, the, the question I have. This is, I'll just read it. The question I have is in regards to the $2 trillion stimulus with the unprecedented uh, situation. What are your thoughts on inflation effects from possible uh, price inflation to an increase in money supply, money, in, uh, monetary inflation? In other words, do you think that the $2 trillion will impact the real estate investors? And are your thoughts the inflationary potential hyper? inflation effects. So I know we talked about that a little bit. Let me get my crystal ball for you. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, the, the truth is um, you are absolutely right. That's one of my biggest concerns. In fact, that's why I left it for one of the last slides. I really do believe that when you get to a point where an economy cannot pay the debt service, which is what we're getting to, that's a problem. Uh, and what I tell people is when you look at a country's financial ability, do you know how many countries can't do what we just did to bail themselves out? They can't even print money. They just can't. Uh, and so, because they, they're not strong enough, their credit worthiness isn't, isn't there. Um, so for the fact that our country could do that, that's incredible. But on the other hand, the long-term repercussion is that we are going to be dealing with some form of inflation. Uh, historically, and again, I don't want to put fear in anybody, but historically, the way that uh, some of these inflationary markets get somewhat corrected is by burning money. Right? So they burn a lot of this money that's in circulation. Some of that is with bullets, right? which just means they, they, there usually are some form of conflict, some form of wars. Uh, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories for you guys. I mean, this is not about a negative thing, but it's been interesting to see that there was a deal going on prior to this COVID-19 thing where China was trying to cut a deal before anyway so they can start trading oil. Because I don't know if you guys know, but in order to trade oil, you got to trade through U.S. dollars. That was a deal that America cut years ago. Uh, so that was about to be the first time that they deviated from that currency. And somehow now everybody still has to trade through the U S dollar. And funny enough, we're looking at oil right now and it's dropped. So Russia has been impacted by this in a massive way. Uh, and I'm saying all that to say that there's ways that countries have to deal with how to deal with, with inflation. We're a position where our credit worthiness may not be the best, but it's probably one of the strongest. Our military is pretty strong. And so as long as we have good bullets and good, <laughs> you know, jets and good, um, you know, professionals out there, that's going to bring some strength because again, at the end of the day, your credit worthiness is based on how strong your army is. If you really look at it at the bottom line. So I, I am expecting inflation. I don't expect us to be like Zimbabwe and all these other countries in the past. They're just like, it was just insane amount of hyperinflation, but you can expect it. And if you own real estate, you'll be happy. You do. And, and that's kind of the point here is, you know, let's be proactive knowing that if this happens today and the, repercussion is two to five years from now is where you start seeing that impact. Then what are you doing now? Cause that's, what's going to make the difference of whether you're broke in the future or whether you're becoming wealthy. And that's really at the end of the day, what it comes down to. Right. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. So a loan officer told us uh, not to modify our mortgage yet because the government may come up with lower rates and a program that we may miss if we modify. What do you think? That's to Regina. Yeah, I mean, if you're trying to do a loan modification right now, I mean, with lower rates, 
I don't really know what they're going to do uh, about that. I mean, I really don't have any intel internally from anybody telling me that they're making some major adjustments. Um, it is a process anyway to do some form of loan modification. So, you know, I would just say start the process now and the more proactive you are with the whatever they're giving you, you know, the better chance you're going to have a deal in the future. I, I don't see that being a massive, like, I'm not going to say wait two weeks and exactly in two weeks rates are going to drop. I, I don't see that being such a massive difference, if that makes any sense. So if anything right now, while everybody's still in quarantine, might be probably a better chance for you to get a better deal than when everybody's back on the market. Because remember, when everybody's back and working, even if it's at 50%, the confidence of the market's going to go up. And that means the confidence of those lenders will go up too. And so think about that too. Yeah, that's a, t that's a tough one, uh, Regina, because I'm almost the other way, siding with your, your uh, loan officer thinking like, we haven't necessarily seen the slack in the line of what the issues are to come. And so if there's a lot of banks not, you know, necessarily addressing the issue, but we'll just be kind of demand where the government may be forced to implement something. Um, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, it's really hard to say on that one. Um, so maybe you do get everything go in a loan mod, the last time I checked, though, you have to be behind on your mortgage to, to actually take advantage of it. And if you're not behind in it, you may not want to fall behind in it as well. I, it's just one of those things. Like, it's tough. It really is. It's a tough question. <laughs> yeah. So we're leaving that one kind of open. Uh, I guess yeah. we're on the fence of... Uh, Pray about it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's probably the best. When in uh, doubt. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we don't know enough about your situation, I guess. Yeah. You know, if you are behind, if you, if, uh, anyways, uh, seeing if they could put a tack it on the end, that would be nice if that's something they could do and not show you 30 days late. And, uh, you know, I just don't know all the criteria to make some of this stuff happen. Um, so maybe on the next call, we could figure out what some, what some of the guidelines are on that specifically. Mm -hmm. All right, you guys. Well, that, uh, that takes us to the end of the questions and I appreciate Rick taking the time. I hope you guys did as well. I learned a lot. Hope you guys did. This is great information. Uh, I'd love to do more of these with you, Rick, and actually educate uh, everybody on it. And if you're able to bring this and like, keep us up to date on this. I would sure. Be We'd love to. Like yeah, I, we're literally I'm things are changing on by the week. So we'll be working yeah. on stuff. So you let me know. We're, we're definitely, we're, we're more than happy to. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe we, we uh, lock a date down in two weeks because I think yeah. that's probably enough to see, you know, what's going on two weeks. We should have some, some states coming yeah. back online and kind of see, start to follow what's happening with them. Um, sure. And if you want just something to make it interesting, maybe we can have some of the, the attendees give us a couple of addresses they're analyzing and I can have my team analyze the, the zip code data and we can just oh, yeah. show them on the screen. Here's what's going on in those specific zip codes. Sure. Some of you guys that uh, are on, if you want to just uh, message either Rick or, or us at Riki and just let him, let us know and we'll do some digging in on your guys' area and then we'll see yeah. you guys in by tentatively two weeks from now. And uh, we'll send out an email to all you guys that are on tonight's call so you guys could participate in that one. Kind of a follow-up. All right. Hey, Rick, I know it's, it's later there. I appreciate the time. I really do. Thank you for spending it with us this evening and educating us and getting us up to speed on what you guys are doing. And I hope everybody got Rick's information. If you guys want to reach out on a deal that you guys have, Great. Um, anyways, um, again, appreciate your guys' time. Thank you. It's a pleasure, man. I'm looking forward to the next one. Absolutely. Thank you, Rick. Have a great day. All right, day. guys.